Rowley filling in for DVR here with Eno Saris. It is Thursday, July 20th. We are about two weeks away from baseball's trade deadline, give or take. All the buzz on some guy named Shohei Otani. Perhaps you've heard of him. Uh, we are going to get a little bit into Otani, but we're also going to talk a little bit about um, teams who we feel like have a chance, even though the odds say they're against them. We're going to get into teams that we're confused by. And of course, we are going to talk about who should land Shohei Otani should Angels owner Artie Marino decide, you know what, I'm going to just give away this generational talent because there's no way he's signing here because the Angels can't win. Or can they? They just swept the Yankees. I don't know. You know, they're a 500 team. One, how are you? Two, where do you stand in the trading Otani sweepstakes? I'm good. I've, I haven't had a great week. My phone has been broken, and that it's like uh, it's like an, it's like having a broken arm or something. <laughs> We're all just like so addicted to our phones. I'm like, what's going on out there? I can't can't get my uh, every second update on the on the world. But uh, it has. I, I I'm reading a book. Whoa. <laughs> A real one or like a scratch and sniff? <laughs> You're right. Yeah, no, I'm reading a real book. So uh, that's uh, that's uh, for another time. I'll, I'll wait till I finish it to give a review on it. But uh, no, I'm fascinated by this Otani thing. I just had to record um, a little thing where I play acted as Andrew Friedman for Effectively Wild, Ben Lindbergh's show over at Fangraphs. And um, I, I gave an offer of a choice of Michael Bush... Uh, and Gavin Stone, and then uh, Ryan Pepio, and uh, another arm a little bit lower, but that was close to the big leagues. And so my impression that it was that what Artie, well not, well not necessarily what Artie wants, but what uh, Perry Manasian will want is something that will rejuvenate mm, the pitching staff, I think mostly, but also just rejuvenate the team now. You know, like somebody like players that can step onto the field now uh, because he still has Mike Trout. You know, it's still a team that's sort of built to win now. And so he doesn't want, you know, your high A 17 year old like this is going to be a trade where he wants ideally someone who's had some major league experience um, and can step in for him. I think he'll want a position player and then like two or three arms on top of that. So I think that's the structure of the deal that that would that would make sense for the Angels. Um, and, but I thought for our, our, our thought experiment, we might want to take the Dodgers out of it because the, I think what the real risk here is for a team that's acquiring Otani is you don't have him for any longer than this season. So are you going to give away pieces that could be six year players for these other teams for three months of a guy, the Dodgers, I feel like, you know, the way I ended my voicemail, cause it was a, a little fictional voicemail I was supposed to land. It was we all know we're going to get them anyway in free agency. So <laughs> that if you're the free free if you're the Dodgers and you're probably the the sort of favorite free free agency, maybe uh, the the numbers work a little differently in your head. But um, I think for this other team, we should think about a non-Dodgers team that should be aggressive for Shohei Otani, knowing they might only get him for three months. So, you know, what do you think are like the sort of characteristics of a team like that? You know, they should be super aggressive, even if they only get them for three months. I think a team that doesn't have a lot of money ready on the books so that they maybe could take on that. You know, he is owed a, a decent amount. I know and it's more not million. Yeah. yeah, mega millions. But, you know, that's a decent amount for teams who have already allocated payroll and a team that can give up some top shelf prospects without totally gutting its farm mm -hmm. system. I think, you know, teams that obviously want to win are going to acquire him. But you think I think you need more than just like two or three top prospects and then nothingness. You know, if you're going to create this tangible window. And that's why, you know, I'm going with the Baltimore Orioles who, you know, are probably not going to do it. But, you know, it is a fun thought exercise to think about it. I was actually talking to somebody today and they said, uh, you know, familiar with the, the Orioles line of thinking. And, you know, they kind of pointed out that the Orioles playbook here after they got uh, made an, an acquisition last night getting Fijinami from Oakland is to get another reliever. And instead of getting a starting pitcher, just shorten it up and have like a turbo bullpen, right? Have like the fifth and ninth innings taken care of. And that takes care of your 
you know, your innings limit with these young guys. It takes care of the fact that your starting rotation is a bit of a weak spot. But let's pretend for a second they want to go after Otani. They have seven of the top 77 prospects in baseball. So even if they give up four of them, and maybe a guy on their big league roster, because let's not forget they have a crowded infield as well. Maybe they they deal with Colton Kowser, who's currently on the big league team, right? I don't think they they deal Gunnar Henderson. I don't think they deal catcher Adley Rushman. And I think pitcher Grayson Rodriguez are another guys that like they must keep. But what if they say, you know what? You can have one of these other guys on our roster and you can have some of these prospects. And still at the end of the day, we'll have three, maybe four top 100 prospects. I think that's a move that you should make because let's not forget the Orioles were tragic for the last five years. This is the beginning of their window. But, you know, you know how windows go, right? Teams think they're going to be good for a while, and then injuries happen, and they never are. The Orioles, as we record, in a first-place tie with Tampa Bay, for the first time all season, Tampa Bay doesn't have full possession of first place. What would help invigorate a team more than getting basically the equivalent of an ace pitcher and Aaron Judge? That's what Shohei Otani is. You know, yeah. I know people, people have quibbled because he hasn't done that well at Camden Yards. That is an incredibly small sample size one. Two, yeah. everything we know about Joey Otani is this guy is a competitor. Throw him in the middle of a pennant race. I mean, I oh, saw this guy goodness. at the WBC, right? right? I mean, this guy lives for this. I think we would maybe even see another level as crazy as that sounds. I think maybe you would even see better play than you're seeing now because all of a sudden these games really matter. This guy wants to win. There's one thing we don't need translated, right? And that is that losing absolutely disgusts him. So send him to a place where he can win right away. Bring him on a Baltimore Orioles team who isn't necessarily, I don't think, mortgaging the future, but making a real go at it here and setting themselves up that maybe the window isn't the five years they thought. Maybe it's three now because of this. You know what? Flags fly forever. They win the World Series this year, you know, or even get to the World Series this year. No one is going to say, oh, you shouldn't have gotten rid of that prospect who eventually made it to the big leagues for a couple of years. No. Yeah, I think, you know, they could afford, uh, you know, Joey Ortiz um, or Colton Kowser as the centerpiece. Uh, that would be mm -hmm. a person. Joey Ortiz could step in in the middle infield for them right away. Uh, Colton Kowser in the outfield. That's they're ready to go. They're valuable prospects at that level. Um, then they also have, I think, some of the pitching depth that's nearby uh, that they could uh, pick from to uh, to uh, put it together. I I saw some really good stuff plus numbers for Justin Armbruster as a you know triple A guy for them. Yeah, um, he's interesting. I'm so glad you brought him up. People compare him to John Means and that like oh. he didn't get a whole lot of like publicity and stuff, and then just yeah. all of a sudden was on the map. But there's been some. Some some buzz about him lately. So yeah, it's so you you're the a, first person I've heard talk about him. Yeah, a buzzy Outside triple of the organization. A, yeah. buzzy triple A arm, a, an everyday position player, and then you throw in another another arm that's nearby. Drew Rom is a guy that's that's come up. So you start packaging those together. That's that's a package that, uh, frankly. Uh, could beat uh, the Dodgers package I was throwing out there if you like the arms better. If you like, you know, Michael Bush has some swing and miss. Maybe you like Joey Ortiz's contact rates better. So it's definitely up there with the Dodgers one. And I don't think it kills the Orioles long term. And the last mm -hmm. part that I think that, that why the Orioles is such a great uh, choice is just that I think this has to be a team that is like 80, 90 percent chance of making the playoffs. You know, he's not yeah. going to go to a team um, that has like a 20 percent chance of playoffs. Like, I, I don't think that like the the Guardians, like, do you think the Guardians, like, do you think he'll be super excited about going to the Guardians in that division? No, but I don't think you can ever count out A.J. Preller on anything. And they're pretty low. <laughs> uh, I, 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 the vibes I get is more like, you know, if you guys get it together, then then fine. But I, I, I'm not going to. And they have they have very little to add. Also, the, the, the pieces that the Padres do have are further away. So, I mean, I guess you could get you could get uh, Artie Moreno and Perry Manajan excited about Ethan Salas, of course, as a catcher um, or uh, Jackson Merrill, their, their shortstop. But uh, those guys are pretty far away, I think. And, and yeah. you know, you got Mike Trout now. So I, I, I think the Orioles really have uh, the package that puts it together. You know, in fact, I think the Rays uh, are similar in that regard. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned the money. Right now, the estimated payroll over at Fangraphs for the Rays is 78 million. They finished last year at 86. Now, 
you know, it's 10 million for uh, for Otani, but you could improve uh, the prospects that you're that you're putting on the table uh, in order to to get better return. Yeah, I was thinking about that too. Is there someone that the Rays are king of buying and selling, right? Is there someone that they could take off their roster and flip elsewhere that they feel like isn't or, worth the money to clear? Or, or they ask the pay? Angels to pay some of that money. You yeah. know, like, hey, you pay five million, you get a better prospect. And uh, in the language of, of the prospect world, you got that twenty to eighty scouting scale. And and I was looking at the value of of, of different prospects and the surplus value that Otani you know represents and like what would be a fair trade and you have to think about the fact that people are prospect hugging hard hardcore um, you know with uh, you know for example Curtis Mead is a fifty five future pro value prospect for the uh, for the for Tampa Bay. 55 is is pretty good. It's not uh it's not the top sort of 20 prospects, 25 prospects. Those guys are 60, 20 to 80 members. So 55 is better than average uh but not, you know, one of these prime top end prospects that probably won't get traded. So Curtis Mead might be uh according to some lists one of the better names that we've mentioned here. Uh he's a 55. Joey Ortiz is a 50, you know. Uh Michael Bush is a is a 50. So what you could say is, hey, pay down $5 million of what Otani's owed the rest of the season, and we'll give you Curtis Mead, who might be the best prospect that you, that you see in these deals. And then we'll throw in, you know, Mason Montgomery is a double-A arm that's pretty exciting. Uh, we can, and, and, you know, it's the, the Rays. They have, they have a, a group of arms. Maybe they give them Cooper Criswell. Whatever it is, they've got, they've got arms to trade. And then they get an ace, you know, and, you know, with glass now that's co aces plus he helps their hitting. Plus this is like, you know, this feels like a real kind of go for it year for the Rays. You know, they're, they're yeah. so far out in front, 97% to make the playoffs uh, other than the Braves. There's nobody higher, um, you know, in terms of like run differential, they're second, uh, it, you know, it's, they've, and they've stepped back a little bit, right? Like they were, out in front, they were the front runners, um, and they still have uh, 60 wins. But you know, the Braves kind of uh, kind of showed them who's boss a little bit in that series, and uh, uh, and have come out in front of that. So I think the Rays, you know, kind of you know, be like, hey, let's stop going to the playoffs. Let's uh, win the World Series. Yeah, and here's the interesting thing, though, and. I, if the Angels keep winning and their next two series are against the Pirates and the Tigers, this all may be moot. I know it's great podcast fair, but like if the, if Mike Trout is coming back and the Angels, who are now 500, keep winning, do you trade him if you're Artie Marino? If you know you have no chance of getting him back, but you're pocketing sponsorship money, you're getting all that Japanese television money that you know is probably significant just to watch Otani, right? So is it worth it? For the Angels to trade him. Yeah, does anybody buy an Angels Otani jersey the minute he's traded? So, you know, how many, how many, how much jersey sales are you are you losing? Does that money TV uh, money? Sponsorships money with go, Japanese companies? Does that money well, some of the sponsorships feels like something you pay for at the beginning of the year or you pay for a year, you know. It's like so yeah. I don't know if that goes away. And yeah. does uh doesn't jersey money go to like the central fund and get redistributed? I don't know, but what about the RSN money? Yeah, uh, I think that's like negotiated on a yearly level, too. So I think that the main risk is people stop coming to the park. Yeah. Wait a second. I thought when more people watch the games, the RSNs generate more money. I think in a year to year level. I mean, basically, uh, when you when you negotiate with the RSN, you, you, you have like a five year deal or a three year deal or whatever. So I think they're locked in at least uh, to the end of the year on whatever deal uh, they've got. Um, so I think the big main risk is people don't come to the, to the park, but that's, that's still money. That's still, you know, you're still making yeah. money at the ballpark. And so that's, and then you also have to think that if you, uh, you put the qualifying offer tag on him and he goes, uh, you get a pick that's actually worth, uh, you know, five to 10 million, depending on where you slot in. So, yeah. um, you know, there's some money that he, that he's leaving out there right now. The playoff odds for the angels are at 14%. That's not terrible. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's around where the Mariners are. 
Um, you know, it's behind the Red Sox, but uh, people are very excited about the Reds, uh, and they're about the same as the Reds. The yeah. Reds have a well, 17 they went on a losing streak too, right? The Reds, mm. they they got so hot and then very quietly they lost. What is it? Six but it tells you a little bit about how much your playoff odds can change, right? Like the Reds, sure, the Reds were more of a single digit team, you know, two, three weeks ago, and now they're an 18% chance to make the playoffs. Yeah. You know, if the if the Angels have a good run, they, they can get back in it. But I, I think in the end, I would trade him, uh, you know, if you're going to ask me for a question because for a real answer and not a waffling, um, just because, you know, I don't think they're winning that division. Uh, the Astros are 53 and 43 uh, and the Rangers are 58 and 39. Um, and if you just look at uh, what it'll take to, to take the wild card in the American League, it's going to take beating two American League East teams. Uh, the worst American yeah. League team, East team, has 51 wins. So you're yeah. two wins out of the Red Sox. You know, you're three wins, four wins, five wins out of those other guys. Uh, you're you're betting. You have to. It's like not only how many games out you are. It's like how many teams are between you and the wild card. You know, yeah. How many yeah. other teams you need to start to fall apart? So you kind of need most of the AL East to fall apart. Um, and I think that's, that's not necessarily happening. So I yeah. think I would trade him and I, and, and, you know, this kind of goes as a segue, I guess, into our next, you know, segment, which is, uh, you know, which of these teams you like, do you, you know, among these teams that are sort of 30% and lower, uh, on, on fan graphs, you, would you pick other teams, uh, in that range that I, I think I would rather, uh, get excited about so yeah some of the teams that have uh less than or 30 percent or less chance of making the playoffs according to fan graphs are uh the yankees the red Sox, the guardians the mariners the angels uh, the mets the reds uh and the padres so yeah who do you who do you like in that group it's got to be the Yankees. I mean, I know the sky is falling right now because, like I said, they just got swept by the Angels. Aaron Boone said, yeah, we know we stink. Their offense has been atrocious. There's no way around that. Also, Rodon has been a big disappointment. I mean, last night he has a terrible start. Clearly fans get into him. He blows a kiss to fans in the stands. Did you see this highlight? No, I did not. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's going to go over real well in New York. Uh, not good. He's an but irascible listen, fellow. Yeah, they are getting back Aaron Judge at some point. And that is like But it I may said, not be a hundred percent judge, right? Like they said no, no. It sounds like something that would normally take surgery, but he's just gonna play through the pain a little bit. Yeah. So if anything, and we've talked about this on this show before, it exposes how incredibly one dimensional the Yankees offense is because you know, you take out Aaron Judge, who obviously is a huge player. He broke the American League record for home runs just a year ago, signed a you know a mega deal to stay in New York, but uh, on one hand, you know, he's a great player. On the other hand, they have nobody else in that lineup. And that's really become apparent with his prolonged absence. But I do think getting him back is important. And I do think that the Yankees are going to be a team that, you know, they're not just going to say, oh, let's just sell off for spare parts. Like they're built to win. Their their fan base is not going nuts. They haven't won since 2009, which is an absolute lifetime for New York Yankee fans who grew up in, you know, the 90s, the early 2000s. So I, I do think the Yankees, Still have a good chance here. As you mentioned, the Red Sox in there too. It's crazy that the American League East, and we've talked about this all year, that whole division is a division full of playoff teams. So I don't think we should panic when it comes to the Yankees. I think they're going to make some moves. I do think they're feeling the heat because for the first time in Brian Cashman's tenure as GM, what, 17, 18 years, he fires a coach in season. They do have Sean Casey now heading up their hitting coach. I don't know how much of an impact that's going to have, especially immediately. I think people think coaches do more than they do, but I still have reason to believe the Yankees. There are pockets of the schedule where they're going to be okay. And Aaron judge at some point is going to come back. And even an 80% Aaron judge. And I, you know, you've heard Manny Machado and, and other players talk about this before, you know, playing at 70, 80% when you're that big of a star is still a significant boost to a team. So even if Aaron judge is only 80%, adding him back to that lineup is still going to help the Yankees moving forward. So I have not given up on them. Totally. I think that they're going to be fine. 
Yeah, uh, well, I wonder what kind of a trade you'd gift them. I mean, I, I think Stanton is, you know, right now you can see that he's hitting the ball really strong, and, and he's, in fact, reduced his strikeout rate recently. So I, I could see Stanton going on a tear. Uh, you know, he's healthy. You got, I think Volpe has really uh, turned heads with uh, his his play recently, really t- cut down on the strikeout rate, looks like an everyday player now. So you've got, you've got decent uh, players at, at short, at second, uh, you got a, a star in right. Uh, Bader, I think, is a, is a two way guy and, and and a really valuable piece in center. Um, you know, maybe Lemayhu. Lemayhu's probably an upgrade over Donaldson, whose career might be over now. Uh, you really just need Rizzo to get going, and he hasn't really shown it yet. I think he's on a thirty plus day home run uh, drought. So, you know, Rizzo getting going would would do a, a lot for this team. Uh, but I think that an obvious uh, trade opportunity would come uh, maybe in a corner outfield position. I mean, right now the the depth chart says IKF, Bowers, Calhoun, McKinney, and left. And um, I think that's uh, those are part-time guys that are okay. But, you know, if you put an impact player there, even in a rental situation, um, I, I think that might be something they could do. Or do you think it's more, uh, you know, a pitcher they need or – where would you where would you gift them a player if you could in order well, to get them I to mean, the playoffs? Yeah, I like the addition of an outfielder because listen, you can't just add Aaron Judge and say, All right, we're good now. What if he re injures his toe? What right. if, like you said, he's 80%, but still like the power isn't there for some reason? Um, they honestly need a lot of improvements because Rodon hasn't been that great since he came back, and he was their big like starting pitching addition. So I would kind of look for for that as well. I mean Everyone upgrades their bullpen this time of year, so you always got to listen in and kind of see what what could make it better. But to me, adding another bat that's not named Darren Judge would help the Yankees immensely. Yeah, I I have some hope for Rodon. Uh, you know, not all the movement is 100% back for him, uh, but the velo was. Um, and so, you know, what was really missing for him was the command. Uh, and he's never been a command artist, but I don't I don't know that he's going to be this bad. Um, yeah. So I, I think that to some extent, getting getting people right is going to be what does this for them. But, you know, one thing that that, that does not impress me about this Yankees team uh, that I was kind of surprised about when I looked in the numbers is uh, they have only scored eight more runs than their opponents all year. Um, and I, I always had this impression of them as, you know, being in a tough division, but actually being a, a really quality team at 50 and 47 with an eight, you know, with an eight run yeah. differential, you might expect them to actually be 500. Yes. Um, but run differentials don't tell the whole story because look at the Padres run differential. However, they've been involved in many blowout wins. That's you true. know, I, I remember I covered the Orioles in 2012 and they had a negative run differential and people seem to think, well, they couldn't possibly go to the playoffs like that. Well, yes, they went to the playoffs. They won the wild card. They ended up losing the DS to the Yankees. So sometimes the run differential can actually be something that is just an anomaly and doesn't actually have a whole lot of bearing on whether the team is good or not, because let's see where San Diego, where their run differential is. Yeah, it's pretty good. It, it, you know, the yeah. Padres run and they're 46 is- and 50. Yeah, it's it, it kind of stand it stands out a little bit because they they've scored forty six more runs than their opponents. Yeah, uh, basically the same as the Orioles. The Orioles are fifty eight and thirty seven, and the Padres are forty six and fifty. So right, you're so right. Look at it as oh, it could be bad luck. Well, it's not. They're just involved in a lot of blowout wins. But the uh, Padres are also five and fifteen in one run games, and that I think is a bit of bad luck. So it's yeah. a little bit of both. And you're right that uh, run scoring is not always evenly distributed. So there's sometimes when it's, you know, it's 15 to nothing. And that doesn't mean much about your team other than they just want to laugh or, you know. Uh, but I was looking at uh, projected rest of season run differential, uh, which I think is a little bit better uh, test of true talent. Padres second. Padres are second. They're projected to go 37 and 29 the rest of the way um, and score almost should- five five runs a game and, and allow 4.3 it seems maybe silly but what i'm seeing right now when i look at the padres and i'm gonna pick i'm gonna pick them as as my team is manny machado is right again yeah and uh you know he had the ankle injury last year that was a you know that was a tear other people could have opted for surgery he, he i don't know if he went down the aisle and this year he had the hamate thing and other people, you know, are, you know, really deal with that for a long time. And, you know, he took the minimum and came back. 
Um, he obviously wasn't 100%. Like you said, the 80% Manny Machado wasn't wasn't exactly great, um, but he was there. He helped them win some games, and now he's on a tear. Um, and I think he looks uh, really excellent. Um, uh, I love his swing, by the way. I, I, you know, people talk about lefty swings, and they, they love lefty swings. To me, Manny Machado's swing is one of the sweetest swings in baseball just because it just seems so effortless. I don't yeah. know if that's something you've noticed before, but um, yeah, I mean, it, listen, it seems like as that team goes as how Manny goes, right? He put them on his back last year without Tatis and, and really kind of cemented himself. That's more help guy now. There. <laughs> that's more help now, but they didn't play well when you like, it seems like when he's playing well, the Padres win, yeah. right? Like, I don't know what it is. And like, they're oftentimes, especially when, you know, they weren't, winning but Tatis was still playing well like you can't say that about every guy on that team I don't know what that is other than maybe randomness I don't know mm -hmm. but you're right I mean he's been terrific he's been on a tear for really the last couple of weeks and you know it's no coincidence that you know the Padres are still in that limbo they're they're sort of in the Mets boat of like one week this team can do it they can reel it off and then the next week you think it's too late for this team right can yeah. every team be the 2021 braves and the 2019 nationals no right. historically historically <laughs> no and there's like that's why we have these playoff percentages at all because most teams right. do that <laughs> right and there's like five teams that are banking on that happening now uh what is interesting and as we know and have said before and probably why you also like the Padres is you know that Preller AJ Preller is going to be aggressive they're not going to just fold the house of cards right which is I'm sure another factor in picking them down the stretch is they're if they do anything they're going to probably be tiny buyers right yeah yeah they're certainly I not going to sell I think the idea of selling Hater and Snell now is out the window. Uh, you know, I just uh, they've played they played well enough coming out of the thing, and it it, it is sort of series to series uh, with them on what what will will happen. But um, you know, I think a couple of things that were interesting just happened in, in San Diego. Uh, Robert Suarez came back, and huge. you know, I think that's pretty huge. Yeah, I mean, he throws huge really. For them really hard and nick martinez and stephen wilson do not throw really hard tom gross cosgrove does not throw really hard so this gives them a really hard throwing guy uh to pair with hater and you push everybody back in that bullpen a little bit because i think eventually he will be the setup guy so now you've got two two guys righty lefty at the back end of the bullpen who throws super hard and i i, I like that uh, also they made some aggressive moves in you know and letting uh austin nola go and and giving Luis Camposano uh, more playing time, uh, so they they prioritize offense at the catching position. Uh, and then lastly, uh, one thing I do like about this team um, is that I think their lineup is very diverse in terms of approach. Now you got Manny Machado, who's kind of hit tool plus uh, plus power, not the most patient guy in the world. Um, but then you have Soto, who is like literally the most patient guy in the world. <laughs> yeah. You know, Grisham's a really patient guy, too. And then you have Tatis, who's a free swinger. And then you have Xander Bogarts, who's kind of in between, makes a lot of contact, great hit tool, you know, will take a walk. I, I think this is a really nice, diverse lineup that can, you know, righty, lefty, can do a lot of things uh, uh, for you. Uh, maybe a, a, a lefty DH because Matt Carpenter um you know hasn't been uh what they expected uh maybe some sort of lefty dh uh could be something that I would gift them and and that might not cost that much honestly uh you're just looking for a lefty hitter and you don't care about the you don't care about the position so yeah um, that, that, well, the padres are a team that i could see putting it together i kind of like your idea especially because as you said if they're going to go series by series right now they're 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 trailing um by in, by a run in toronto but after this they play at detroit and then they play three at home against the Pirates. That's an easy six-game stretch. You should win four of those games. Yeah. And if we're really going to play, like, if they get to, if they sniff 500 by the deadline, I think they're going to say, yeah, we're we're good here, right? We think we can keep going. Um, I think all these teams, the Mets also, just waiting to get to that 500 mark to say, like, all right, we can turn it around, right? And I think the Padres are kind of in that situation and the schedule is pretty good. And then, of course, they go to te they, Texas comes and that's going to be tough. Uh, they've got a, a makeup game against uh, Colorado. They play Cincinnati, the Angels after that. Um, oh, wait, no, I'm looking at the wrong month. They didn't play any of those games. I'm looking at the wrong month. Hmm. Hold on. Let me give you the real schedule. Um, 
I was looking at June into July. They actually, uh, according Hang to Fangrass, have the easiest rest of season schedule uh, among the NL West. They do. Oh wait, no, no, that is correct. The MLB thing was weird. Nah, they do play. They do play Detroit and Pittsburgh. Sorry, everyone. Uh, <laughs> then Texas, Colorado, uh, and the Dodgers. So certainly some pretty winnable. I mean, Texas is good, but you know, three of those teams are sellers, clear sellers. Yeah. If you're yeah, not, not going to and... be 500 by then, you know what I mean? And, and another That's thing right I like the about the, the Padres is um, uh, the a the NL East is not as good top to bottom as the AL East. So it's not as no. much of, there's not as many teams you have to beat out from the NL East to make the playoffs. Um, like, could they beat out the Marlins? Yeah, I think they could. Um, and, uh, then, you know, could they beat out the diamondbacks? Yeah, I think they could. So, you know, could they be the second, could there be two wild cards coming out of the West? Will the giants regress? Will the diamondbacks, the diamondbacks bullpen is pretty horrible. So, yeah. you know, and, and they've saw, they've seen a bunch of losses in a row and a lot of it had to do with the bullpen. So, um, uh, you know, I, I would gift the Padres, Charlie Blackman, uh, as a lefty singles hitting DH, uh, that can play the outfield. He kills the Padres, so you take him off that team and and you put him on, uh, put him on the Padres, so that he can't kill the Padres. But also, just uh, I think lengthens that lineup, and he, you know, he can do, a, he can be kind of, you, if you need the, the the home run, you you bring Matt Carpenter off the bench and and let him go for the home run, uh, but maybe start the game with Blackman so that he can uh, keep that lineup moving. Um, that that's definitely a team I like. Uh, you know, teams that confuse me uh, in this and in, in, in here, you know, are teams like um, the Reds and the Angels. Uh, you know, do you have a team that sort of we we both pick kind of chalk, right? <laughs> we, we said, you know, of the teams that have a 30 percent chance of making the playoffs or not, we took the guys that had 30 percent chances in the Yankees and Padres. Yeah. Uh, but what about the teams beyond them? The What do you what do you think about those? So I was just going to ask you about this because it seems like. It's a it's an interesting time right now because if you just look at trends, like are you are you I guess like worried all the Braves have lost four? I'm not worried about the Braves. No. Uh, you know, are you worried the Miami lost six in a row? Maybe, right? And then we come down to one of those teams that you talked about in the Reds, who are three and seven over their last ten. And for me, Cincinnati has to make a move. They have to add a starting pitcher if they're going to stay in this thing. I think they had that great hot streak that put them. You know, right behind Milwaukee is where they sit right now in a very weak NL Central. I think no one is fooled by the Cardinals winning five in a row, right? That's a team we've talked about before, should still sell. I know John Mazziliak said the other day that they're going to approach this trade deadline with an eye on the next one. But to me, the Reds are interesting. If they make the right moves here, like what if the Reds got Otani? Then all of a sudden we're saying, like, let's go. But yeah, there's but not that, a whole it lot. It would be such a risky uh, situation would. for them, I think, in terms of it this, would. like, you know, they're not going to make the wild card. So there's no, there's no, like we're going for the division. If we don't get the division, we get the wild card. I don't, I don't think that's in their, their future. No, what, their, their farm is thin too. It's good. But I think that that would, they're not as deep as like an Orioles system. Um, yeah. I think that's, but, a, that's a good point, but what they do have is a lot of position players. So what I would love for the reds um, is, you know, sometimes teams make acquisitions at the trade deadline that are not just for the rest of the season. So right. if they could uh, make a trade with someone where they give up, uh, it, it could be a young major league position player. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, they have they have so many pieces right now that somebody like Spencer Steer is sitting sometimes, you know. So uh, I don't know. I'm not going to name one because you know, it make people really mad because it's oh, it couldn't be him. It couldn't be him. But like maybe somebody on that major league team, or maybe even a Nuelve Marte uh, who's in AAA right now. Uh, you give him up and you get a pitcher back that you have for next year too. Yes. And so I think that's, that's the kind of buying the Reds uh, should do is augment that pitching staff, give someone that can pair with Hunter green next year uh, to at the top of that rotation. Uh, that would be amazing yeah. for them. But yeah, I'm not out on them. I think they have a chance to make the playoffs still, even though they're you know mathematically one of the lower teams that we talked about because their division is so weak. We're just seeing the beginning of, of Ellie Dela Cruz, right? And we've seen it before with them that they're capable. I think what people maybe don't realize is when a team goes on a run like that, especially a team that's got a lot of young players like the Reds, it 
mentally kind of changes things for them. It's like we could win eight in a row because we've won eight in a row, Mm -hmm. right? Teams like the Mets and Padres are still waiting for that long winning streak, right? Once you have one, it just gives you so much more of that innate confidence that like this team just did that. We just had a hot week. Why can't we have another hot week? Right? So there is something I think to be said for what those hot streaks do. Not only do they put you in a position where, you know, Kyle Gibson in Baltimore was talking about this the other day, because the Orioles haven't been swept in 70 series, which is remarkable. Wow. Um, he was saying, yeah, not since Adley Rushman came up, but he was saying you have a win streak like that. And it puts you in a position that if you lose the next series, you're not panicked because you've built that padding, right? Mm-hmm. And so the Reds have built this padding where even though they had a down stretch over the last 10, as I mentioned, they know they still have that somewhere in them. These young guys know that they can rattle off if they need five, six, seven, eight wins. And so that's why I think the Reds are, to me, still a dangerous like lurker in that they could get into the postseason and be a really difficult team, especially if they added to their rotation like we were talking about. The vibes are super strong in Cincinnati, I will have to say. <laughs> You've got the elder statesman, Joey Votto, who's like, you know, he's playing to get one more contract, but he's also playing to finally win with a group of players. because It's been a long time since he's won, um, and you can see how much fun he's having. I mean, he had a homer the other day and did this uh, jump arm bash thing where he literally jumped as high as he could. And maybe I think it was because it was Ellie and Ellie's really tall, but you know, he, he was, he was jazzed. Uh, and in those games against the giants where, you know, it was coming down to the last at bats for a lot of those games. Uh, and he kept coming up, you know, in big moments, he struck out to end one game, which wasn't his best, but then he, uh, in another one, he, uh, I think he walked to, to continue, continue to rally. So, you know, he's in this and then the rest of them are all young guys who a lot of them have been playing together for a while, you know, yeah. uh, and uh, that gives them a sort of familiarity and, uh, and a, like, let's, uh, this is our time. Like this is, we all came up together and we all know how good each other is and we all have each other's backs. And it reminds me a little bit of like, you know, when the Royals uh, won the world series, they were a bunch of kids that, you know, had come to up together in the, in the, in the, um, in the system together. So you know, I think that is something to think about. I, I, for me, confusing when I hear the word confusing, what, what you know, which potential contenders are confusing. To me, it's the Mariners that kind of comes to mind yeah. because I, I'm like literally confused. You know, I, I think with, <laughs> with you, you sort of took it with like, yeah, the numbers aren't great, but I'm still excited about them. I just, I don't know what it takes to build a contender in Seattle for some reason. Like, I don't know why it's so hard because when I look at the Mariners, I say, it's a pretty good team, you know, and you've got a, 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 a superstar in center field. You have, uh, you know, you have players that make it work around them. You have some young players that have some upside. You have some veterans that are good. Cal Raleigh is just like a, a really good catcher behind the plate in both defensive and offensive capabilities. I'm just about to put my pitching ranks out tomorrow. And I've got Luis Castillo and George Kirby, both in the top 20 and behind them, Logan Gilbert and Bryce Miller. in the I think in the top 30, 30, 40. So you've got like a bunch of great starting pitchers. Uh, your, 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 your system has been turning out young guys. Uh, the bullpen is top notch. Like, I don't, I, I guess it's the lineup, but I think the park is also just really tough to, to hit in. And they got some bad news today. Uh, sort of breaking news, I guess, but Jared Kelnick has a, a foot fracture, which and is a real it's gut tough punch. One. Yeah, because they're not, it's the lineup. They've been struggling to put together a really good lineup. It wasn't quite a really good lineup, but it was when when Jared was hitting, it was better. And without yeah. him, it's kind of Julio and Ty Oscar and sometimes Ty France, sometimes Eugenio Suarez, but not every time. So it's kind of like two guys you can count on and some other guys that sometimes come through. That doesn't sound to me like a lineup that's going to make the playoffs. But again, you've sort of built to this moment in some ways. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what you do. I think Teoscar Hernandez uh, could be an interesting trade piece if they sell. Um, I do believe he's near the end of his contract. That was uh, they were trying to get uh, a bit of a one-year uh, help in him. So if they do sell, um, uh, Teoscar Hernandez is probably the biggest piece because they, they'd want to be good again next year. 
Um, and uh, I don't know what they would add because I don't know that a rental Tasker Hernandez brings that much back. So, yeah, it, I'm so confused on which way Seattle is going to go because you're right. They're, hitting has just been erratic and part of that has also been julio rodriguez who really has been erratic this season really disappointing for a good chunk of the year honestly and you know you look at that team and the pitching has been so good and you're right they they i mean they have the prospects to make a deal they've got four guys in the top 100 harry ford cole young brian Wu, gabriel gonzalez so they have the farm system but then you wonder like should they Right. Especially with the Kelnick news, especially because they really underperformed the first half. Now they're right around 500. But like some of these other divisions, like the Yankees, so like they are playing in a division where, you know, the Angels, as we talked about, are, are, are threatening. They're right at 500. You know, we know how good. You know, Texas the is Rangers have right? just really left out to the front. Yeah. yeah. Houston, like having a little bit of a down year by their standards. But it's a tough it's a tough division in the West really it is. And so I don't know if you're Seattle, if you're like, yeah, let's push all our chips. in, even though they're coming off such a great story last year and that they finally beat the playoff drought. And I think everybody was looking forward to like watching this window start. And this should be a cautionary tale, in my opinion, of teams who feel like, Oh, our window is just beginning. Cause didn't it feel that way in Seattle last year? Uh, right. Like, this would start a better times. Confused. I'm like, Yes. Like, I'm confused about like, where should I point for next year? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, this guy's going to come up next year and, or they could trade for this. They're not going to trade for, you know, to, to Oscar Hernandez for an impact bat. That's going to be up in the big leagues next year. <laughs> like that's just yeah. not, that's just not how this, his trade value is. So, you know, Harry Ford is exciting. He's a catcher. He's 20 years old. He's at high a, um, yeah. I don't maybe maybe if he hits the high end of expectations, he could debut for them late next year. Um, that could be something to get excited about, but they don't have. And then there's a lot of starting pitchers. Uh, then they have like a 17 year old, uh, you know, who's very far away is their next. Jonathan Classe is a speedy uh, prospect that uh, might have power strikes out a lot and, and plays center field. So, uh, you know, but he himself is only 21 years old. So I, I don't know that the impact prospect, uh, you know, capital is there for their lineup. So, you know, but you know what Jerry DePoto is going to do. He's going to buy and sell at the same time. And I could see him, you know, maybe matching up almost with Cincinnati in a reverse situation where he gives them some sort of, uh, uh, yeah, get Noel Ve Marte back. <laughs> I don't yeah, know what it they... is, but they 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 need, I think, a little bit more young hitters, um, uh, that are that are close to the big leagues, and th that's really hard to get in the trade market. Yeah, that to me, they're the the most confusing team for that reason. And again, I think a little bit of a cautionary tale of how quickly things can kind of unravel, right? Um when you look at them and you look at where they're at and you know, you're right. They probably will try to buy and sell. Didn't they already sell to some extent to clear a little room? Didn't they trade a reliever recently to cl clear a little money to the Mets? Yes. Mm, yeah, they did. Go as it got. Uh, it was, uh, so Chris Flexen uh, and what they did was, and, and the Mets yeah. even released Chris Flexen, but Chris Flexen was due money. Um, so I think they even, yeah, they, they yeah. paid Trevor got to get rid of the Chris Lex and money. Yes. So I, that's, you know, they already cleared the money. Also. Why are they yeah. clearing money? People thought it was so that they could add at the deadline, but you know, now you're like, I don't know. Like, do they add at the deadline? Cause a foot fracture sounds to me like it's an extended stay. That's not a minimum IL thing. So yeah, and in terms of uh, odds, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, a team that's on the lower end, 13% uh, playoff odds. Uh, in terms of uh, projected rest of season uh, win percentage, the Mariners are 3, 6, 9, 11, 12. Uh, you know, so even though they project uh, somewhat similarly to the Astros and Rangers going forward as sort of like 35 and 30 teams, the Astros yeah. and Rangers have banked those wins. So right. th they would actually have to pay at a much play at a much higher uh, 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 pace to, to catch them. And again, yeah. in the AL, you just have the AL East problem. 
where you have to catch the Rangers uh, and you're, you know, you're significantly back at 47 and 48. You're back from the 58 and 39 Rangers. You, you need specifically the Rangers and Astros to fall apart. Um, and I don't think you can sort of dream cast your way ahead of the Rangers, Astros, Blue Jays, Yankees, Red Sox, Orioles, and all that mix. So, yeah, yeah, they're in a tough spot. And them and the Angels are to me the most confusing teams. Is like, should they go for it or not? Because you can make a case on both sides. You look at everyone else, you know, who's flirting with that 500, and it's like kind of very clear what they're gonna do, right? Like Cleveland probably gonna go for it because. Well, go for it in the in their terms because you know they're they're young and Minnesota only has 50 wins and is winning that division. So yeah, Cleveland's probably going to go for it. We talked about the AL East; they got no one near 500. And then you look at these other, you look at everything else, and it's like, well, the Mets are five games under, and so no one's really sure exactly. I think, what the, I think going that to actually do. the Mets and Padres are a little confusing in the same way. Um, a little confusing, yeah. But I think but, but based on you know what that you know what they are built to do. <laughs> like they're built, they're exactly. not like, you know, are they are they win now guys or they win later? What are they? They're definitely win now guys. So yes. If they do sell, it's only guys who are not under contract for next year. And, you know, they might even offer Snell an extension in the next couple of weeks. You know yes. I mean? Well, the Cubs actually are a little confusing, too, because for a while it looked like they might be good this year. Then they had then they kind of hit the rails. Right. Yeah, but then I think, run differential for a 45 and 50 team. Then I think Rickett said something recently that was like, oh, we're definitely going to be sellers where we're at and or no buyers where we're at. And then oh. all of a sudden they went they went like off the rails. So it's like, well, should you be buyers? You're 45 and 50, uh, you know. No, but again, but they're a little bit like the Guardians, where that's a tough. That's like a, a not a great division. I mean, yes. you're 45 and 50. You're looking at 53 and 43. That's different than the Angels being 49 and 48 and looking at 58 and yes. 39. Yes. So. Yes, but you're right. It's clear the intentions of the Mets and Padres are to win. They would only sell begrudgingly, right? Neither of these teams wants to be sellers. And I can't um, imagine like the, the Mets. They're not going to sell Pete Alonso. I'm sorry, they're not going to sell him. They're going to no. they're going to try and sign him. Right. But I don't know what Seattle's doing. Like if yeah. Jerry DePoto is a listener, <laughs> yeah. give me a text, call me back. Tell me uh, what's going on. Man. <laughs> like I just kind of confused by them. Aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just unfortunate. Like, you know, some of these teams like Philly, when they got up to a slow start, you just knew that they were they're They're built to win and they're still going to try to win. But I just, I don't know. I don't know about some of these other teams, Seattle mainly. And the angels, listen, they're either going to trade Otani and fold the whole house of cards or they're not right and it mm -hmm. seems like at 500 they're probably not i think they have to be like four or five games under 500 to convince ownership this is my own speculation at the because of the, i, I mean think... the, the smoke before was that they weren't going to trade him and that's that's yeah. been the, that's been the stance it's almost like a video review where you have to like overturn the the call on the field the call on the field right now is not not trading otani so there actually has to be like 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 good incontrovertible visual evidence that they should trade otani is how yeah. i is how i see like the next couple of weeks going for them you know you buried the lead on the kelnick injury he oh. broke his foot kicking a water cooler after he struck out according to oh. ryan divish their beat writer kids don't be a red ass Oh, come on. That's brutal. Oh, I didn't see that. I just saw the transaction. Dude, yeah, don't Ryan, punch. Ryan Divis tweeted this, yeah. Don't punch the wall with your pitching hand. Don't kick the water cooler. Come on. I, oh. Honestly, it's a little impressive that you would kick the water cooler that hard. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Toes can yeah. fracture. I, I, I fractured a toe just like stubbing it in the middle of the night. fractured his foot, though. Oh, yeah. That's actually worse. Oh, he was so upset about this. Oh, God, he's like crying in this video. Yeah, because you feel so dumb after you do it. You get you're all upset and you do kick something and then you realize, oh, crap. Who's it? There was a there was a pitcher. Was that the Mariners, too? Who punched the wall and, and was out the rest of the year? Hunter Strickland. Hunter Strickland. That's right. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, Devin wow, Williams. Yes. Devin Williams in 2021. Yes, you're right. Yeah, I mean, listen, these guys care, I think, more than people realize. But, yeah, I, I needed to get that in there. I just saw it come across on Twitter, and I was like, whoa, you know, Perry the lead, this casual foot break. Like, it was more <laughs> yeah. than that. Oh, no. Uh, so, yeah, some frustration, not good at all. I don't know if I've seen a timeline for him. Yeah, but in terms of vibes, if the Reds' vibes are good, this this is not good vibes for the Mariners. 
<laughs> no, no, definitely, definitely not good vibes, but always good vibes chatting baseball with you. We've made it through another show without DVR. I'm surprised they're not like you guys are not allowed to do this without Derek. Yeah, <laughs> steady. He keeps those rundowns going, but he's sorting, I think he did his, a good he's job. sorting his boxes right now, and he'll be he'll be uh, all situated next week. He is. He is. Godspeed to Derek as he completes his move back home to Wisconsin. The Brewers stuff is about. We didn't even mention the Brewers in this episode, but don't worry, we're gonna make up for it when Derek comes back. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he didn't have anybody to to, to talk to Brewers with today. <laughs> <laughs> so don't worry about that um so anyway it was a great it was a great afternoon recapping baseball with you Eno as usual he's at Eno Saris I'm at Brit underscore Giroli on Twitter follow us on Twitter get a link to all of our stories subscribe to The Athletic read all of Eno's great stuff Eno had just like a ridiculously mind-blowing story the other day about the way the the park co I'm not going to give too much away but you should read it I caught it like a day late and was like fascinating stuff fascinating stuff also there's gonna be all breakdowns from ken rosenthal all the latest trade deadline stuff more otani than you can handle you know give us a follow also if you like this episode a subscribe a review all that good stuff we would very much appreciate it thanks so much for listening i'm brit giroli with eno saris you've always got the green light here <laughs>